So after four or five months of looking and two months of not having a mill, I finally found one that I like. In the end though, I did have to settle for an import machine. Import from Switzerland. So I'll be honest, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce this. 13? 13. This is a Shaoblin 13. Shublin? Shaoblin? Shaolin? So I didn't know much about this machine, or this style of machine, other than by reputation. I've used almost exclusively Bridgeport and Bridgeport style clones. But for lack of a better way to describe it, I thought mixing it up a bit might make things a little more interesting. Almost exciting. I was looking for something a little bit smaller than the Bridgeport. Space is starting to become a premium here in my garage. Though I don't know how well I did on that front. This machine is certainly shorter than the Bridgeport, but it needs access almost all the way around it, and foot pit on the floor is probably about the same. Though I knew I was looking for this type of what they call Euro mill, and in fact I was looking for decals. Something in the FP1, FP2 range. And I almost settled on this one here. Fortunately, I dragged my feet on it and this S13 popped up. The decal had a lot more in terms of accessories, but the price was higher and it looked like it had been around the block a little bit longer than this one. It, it had a little harder use to it, but it, it was still in decent condition. And then almost out of the blue, I stopped in with a friend of mine to a machine reseller I'd never been to, and he had this S13 tucked back in the corner. Price was spectacular. It didn't give me the warm fuzzies when I first saw it. I'll inset a picture of what it looked like in the warehouse. But I've just been over the moon with how well this thing is cleaned up and the condition that it's in. It's sending some mixed signals. You know, by looking at the machine, it, it looks like it's had some use, but the bearings feel great and the ways feel perfect. And the craziest part is I got this at a phenomenal price. I mean, I sold the worn out Bridgeport at a more than fair market value and really only put five or six hundred dollars on top of what I got for that to get this machine home. That's including shipping and a couple of boxes of tooling. I'll show those to you in a minute. And I got to tell you, I'm just waiting for that karmic payback for this one. So I'll give you just a quick tour of the machine here. There's not all that much to it. I think it's going to be just more of a matter of getting used to where things are and its specific personality. But it all starts right here. Main power switch. Then I've got a direction and coolant selector. That's four positions, so the spindle could go clockwise or counterclockwise with or without coolant. And then the machine's got two sets of motor start and e-stops. One on the right-hand side here by the electrical cabinet and the other you saw on the left-hand side. On the left-hand side, there's start and stop again. A couple of oddball six volt sockets with a switch. I'm not exactly sure what those are for. Immediately above that is the Y axis hand wheel. And there's provisions to mount the hand wheel on the left, right, or on the top. Down below there's a high and a low speed selector. And this really nice uh, stepless speed control. It adjusts from something like 50 to 2000 or 60 to 2100 RPM. That's a really slick feature. It's really convenient compared to having to change belts or belt positions rather or go in and out of back gear with a few lever combinations. The only strangely located feature on the machine is the feed box. I'll take you in for a closer look. So the feeds of the machine are set here around the back. I'll admit the location is pretty awkward to get to. It also has two ranges. There's a high and a low. 
and then you can choose from some preset options through that little window there. That's millimeters per minute, I believe. On the front, where about your right knee would be, is a four-way joystick that controls the X and the Z feeds of the machine. Each powered axis also has stops or trips that you can set via little T-slots. Right below it on the floor is a foot control for feed rate override. When I bought the machine, the feed mechanism wasn't fully working. You'll see that a little bit later, I think. And the feed rate override just didn't work at all. So the machine came with these two boxes of stuff. It's a mix of ISO 30, like shell mill and face mill holders. Some stuff I have no idea what it is. Some ER25 collets and an ER25 collet holder with a key. Also got what looks to be a collet chuck, but I've never seen anything like this before. I mean, it looks like a collet closer, but it's some really small collets. I don't know if you can see somewhat of a, like a snap ring or retaining ring down there. Maybe they're proprietary Shaolin collets, but I didn't get anything with this. The machine did come with a DRO, three axes. It's a good one, but one of the scales are broken, the Z axis, and I'm getting an error reading on X. I'm gonna try to clean the scales out, see if I can get this up and running again. Box number two is horizontal arbors. A shell mill on the vertical arbor, I suppose. Horizontal arbors with spacers in three or four sizes. No idea what this is. Maybe an arbor that goes in a collet, works vertically. There's the ER25 holder. I got a nice selection of milling cutters. I don't know, some nice small radii. Something that looks like it's been damaged and resharpened. Some cutoff saws, but I don't think an arbor that carries any of these. So that's about it. I think that's everything to the show. Oh, I picked up some stuff in preparation for the move. This was a face mill. I used to have an R8 shank for. I got a new International 30 arbor for that. A chuck and International 30 taper. Some Morse taper. I think this is a Morse taper 3. And I got the rest of the ER25 collets. They came in this silly little case. but They didn't send me the little handcuffs for this though, so lost some points there. So anyway, I think that's about it. The rest of this video will just be some random footage from when the mill came in the door through cleanup and installation. Really excited about this new toy and I'm sure you guys will be seeing a lot more of it in the future. So this thing came in a couple of days ago. She got pushed right into that door there. And this is really the first chance I've had to spend some time with it. I do apologize, it's a little dark, this side of my shop, and I'm hand holding. I did some pretty kludgy wiring to see if this thing worked. I'm not all the way yet. I don't have the right plug for this machine. I think it wants a, like a five pole, three phase. So I've got the three phase running in one side and then 220 single phase to the DRO. I was expecting to knock this down, drain all the fluids, clean it up, and usually in this situation, these things get a paint job. But I've been very pleasantly surprised to find that what I thought was a lot of rust is just like a thick grime that's, I mean, it takes a little elbow grease, but it's cleaning up pretty good. And if you can see the difference, between the front and the back there. I really only wiped down this front corner. That handle used to look like these two. Even the table looks like it's cleaning up pretty nice. I mean, that's really just a some degreaser, a razor blade, and a ton of rags. Same thing for half that column there. This thing's gonna take a lot of elbow grease. It's an ISO 30 spindle taper. International 30. I'm, I'm not much up to snuff on these things. I'm coming from an R8. It's kind of a bummer having to switch out all my tooling. I did get a decent number of tool holders and some other stuff. I'll show that to you a little bit later, but nothing really practical, like end mill holders and fly cutters and all that kind of stuff. I didn't get any of that. I got a lot of horizontal arbors. And this, I think, is an ER20 uh, collet chuck, 
but it, I only have like the weird size collets, seven, nine, eleven. I managed to get an eight millimeter end mill in a nine size collet. It's really the only combination I can get a tool in. I'd like to try taking some cuts before I break this thing down, have a little bit of fun with it before I start getting into the cleaning. It's got a really wacko Y axis. It's up here. That's going to take some getting used to. There's no Y travel in the table itself. I've got X and Z and then Y is up here. It sounds pretty decent. So the only real problem I've run into with this machine, and I saw this when I bought it, is the power feeds. I can get X to go left and right and the table will move down. I can't get it to move up. It doesn't seem to engage. Like I said, it won't actually clear. It won't mesh in the up position, so I don't know what's going on. Hopefully you'll be able to see this. It's a little dark in here. But the whole contraption is a bit loose. I don't know. Maybe that's just a cover. It'll go left and right and down. It just won't mesh into that up position to raise the table. It also has a feed rate override. So stepping on this should put this into a rapid. But that doesn't seem to be working. The other curious bit is that it came with the Z-axis scales not attached. It almost looks like the reader head is halfway dissembled under that tape. I'm wondering if that's a coincidence that the uh, it won't raise the table and there's no z-axis scale in there. I don't know if someone was maybe trying to do a lot of heavy drilling or something, you know, by raising the table and, I don't know, screwed up that gearbox and maybe broke the uh, z-axis scale while they were at it. Hard to say. So this isn't the high-speed head, so there's no there's no quill. I don't know how much trouble that's going to be to find one of those. But I do have angular adjustment. So it's better than I expected. This thing was covered in grime back here. When I first saw it, I thought it was just a fixed head. I mean, it's not that much more useful than for what I do, but it's good to know. I've got at least that on here. I worked this uh, pretty fancy looking ROM vise into the deal. I mean, what was I going to do with a milling machine without a vise? He did have a few import vices, but then my eye fell on this one and I just had to have it. It's a ROM 1021595. It's got this crazy four position fixed jaw. I don't know if I need that, but I was pretty excited to get this. Now this table turns out to have some weird size T-slots. So until I make some T-nuts, I'm just gonna make do with best I got. I absolutely love this table. It just seems huge for size of the machine. Of course, that's not long enough. Ah, uh, that's pretty cool. I do wonder how repeatable that is. Looks like you can bolt it down in one of those four positions. I was expecting a pin detent or something, but... I didn't get the handle with this, though. We couldn't find it. I dug through probably ten boxes of handles. All the motions feel pretty darn good. I mean, they're, there's a little resistance there. I'm hoping it's just gummed up ways. But I can take each axis to its full extent, and the amount of force required is almost nil. I mean, the difference across the end, so I'm hoping that means it doesn't have too much wear in it. So now the crazy thing about this machine is it has controls almost on all four sides of it. I don't think it's going to lend well to backing up against a, a wall or in no corner. But anyway, let's give this a try. That's a three flute, eight millimeter cutter. Again, it's the only thing I have that will fit the combination of tooling that I got with this. All right, that sounded pretty good. That was hand fed. I'm going to try the power feed next.
Don't know how well you can see that, but that looks pretty nice in there. There's a small step on the back. It's not even a step. It's just a like a witness mark where I switched from. This was fed by hand and then power feed all the way out. This side was all power feed. Climb cut looks spectacular. This I think is like a 1040, a C40 in Europe. I just can't believe how this thing is cleaning up. I wish I knew more about this thing, who had it, where it came from, what they did with it. But I bet it was in some pretty darn good shape until this machine reseller got a hold of it and threw it in his garage. Those are the overarms back there. And if they still move, you slide forward and convert this into essentially a horizontal mill. Though I don't have the horizontal mill steady, I don't know what you call it, the thing that goes on the other end of these. I'm gonna grab some steel wool. I'm not gonna make you watch me clean this whole machine, I'm just curious. See if this is rust or that same sludge that's dried up all over the machine. That is rust. Though that might clean up pretty all right. All right, captain's log, start date today. I'm slowly moving my way down the machine. I got the head off and the overarms. Again, everything's cleaning up surprisingly well. I also got the table off. You're looking at just the apron here. Table's back there on the ground, right here. And both the table and the head weigh 10 times more than they look like they should weigh. The handles and the dials have cleaned up nice. You can see what that looks like there. Now I really didn't want to take the x-axis off of this machine. I mean, to be honest, it's feeling pretty good and it doesn't look too dirty back there. But I'm running into some problems with the power feed. That's sort of that mechanism back in there. I'm losing some motion in the vertical pin that comes up from the handle and meets that roll pin there. I mean, it still works. It just slips at either extents. So I think I'm going to have to break this table apart and take a look at that gear train on the inside. I mean, what I'm afraid of is taking that table off and this whole thing exploding like a cartoon clock. Just springs and gears everywhere. And, but it's the only way I'm going to get to the bottom of this. Well, I'm almost there. I worked my way down from the top, just trying to straighten her out and deal with as much as I could. It's time to put the head back on, but I'll show you. It's cleaned up spectacularly. The paint has chipped in, I guess, where you'd expect it to chip, where you might store tools or prop your feet up. I sorted out the power feed. It just turned out to be some, some loose cam and the cam and gear mechanism that's in there, and consequently, it also filled full of chips. The feed rate override, the rapids there, the foot pedal on the bottom, I expected, I don't know why, I expected it to be something bad and had almost just sort of resigned to uh, using the machine without it. But I propped it up about three or four inches, which was no easy feat. And it turned out to be the wiring from the micro switch, from the switch, it's not very micro, was uh, crushed and broken. So it looks like maybe either somebody put this down on a high spot or maybe did some damage when they picked it up with a forklift. So I managed to move this thing. I think you saw me put the head on and I did a couple odds and ends and decided to start getting it into its final spot in the shop. It took probably an hour for me to move it all of 12 or 15 feet. I took it really slow. I'm sure I could have just shoved it across this space, but something this heavy, it just always makes me nervous. I used a floor jack and a couple of homemade skates I made quite some time ago. I only have two skates, wish I would have made four, but it may have worked out for the best. These, these skates tend to all go their own way and two of them I could keep under control and steer the machine, just sort of tapping them around with a hammer. But with four of them, at least made this way, it, it may have been like trying to herd cats. So I haven't moved it up against the wall yet. I still need to clean the coolant pump and tank and I've got to do something probably about these uh, welding bottles. 
Oxia Acetylene. They've just always been here. Probably not the smartest thing in the world to keep them near my machine tools, but they've sort of been standing in that position and bolted to the wall pretty much since I started this hobby. It's a union seniority kind of thing, but I'll have to see what I can do. The last big puzzle piece, like I mentioned, is cleaning that toilet over there. Once that's on and I test to see if it's actually working, I can bolt it to the back of the machine and tuck it back into its space against the wall best I can. All right, so I have the coolant pump and tank installed. It's pretty gross back there, but... And the machine is pretty much where it's going to end up. Still have to do something with those bottles, but I have access to the feed selector there. Let me get this thing on a tripod before I make somebody sick. So I've got a little more space between the mill and the lathe, which is good for, you know, I've, I have run into space issues when I've run long work through the spindle bore. The mill, however, doesn't take up that much more space effectively than the bridge port did. The footprint on the ground is pretty much the same. Surprisingly, it looks like I have a little more access around the machine. Just because of the way the controls are, I couldn't push it as far back as the bridge port. Though I do have a ton more, let's call it headspace. So once I move those bottles, I think I've got some more wall space for, you know, tooling and parallels and whatever else needs to be hung up around the machine. So when all said and done, I have to admit I'm pretty happy with how things turned out. Looks like I got a great machine and headache start to finish was, I don't know, about a week, 10 days time. Figured it could have gone worse. So now I don't think there's much left to do than getting the screw around and uh, get to know each other.